founder and owner of Playout Apparel LLC, doing business as Playout Underwear. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Leifer. I'm the co-owner of Playout Underwear, and I'm also the creative director. This is Abby. I have no background in fashion whatsoever, um, but I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan in the Midwest um, and moved to New York City for college um, and have lived in, in Michigan, in New York, and also spent a year in England and then moved to, back to New York City. Uh, Elizabeth, um, I grew up in LA and I did like a quickie stint for six months in Hawaii. I lived in San Francisco in the Bay Area for about five years in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, moved back to Los Angeles and then moved full time uh, to New York in 09 after commuting quite a bit for work back and forth. Oh, I realized I didn't say anything about my background set. So, sorry. <laughs> Uh, I um, so I have been in fashion for a long time. Uh, I'm actually the um, director of creative production for a fashion brand right now uh, as my day job, um, and I was a I've been a stylist and a producer and uh, a script supervisor, and before that I was a scenic artist for TV and movies. So I think that you skipped the uh, educational background and went right to work history. Oh, uh, educational background. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Abby and Liz show in case you missed that part. <laughs> the only thing we're gonna miss here is cocktails. Um, <laughs> um, I, so I, um, I started apprenticing working artists when I was 10. And I started going to um, classes at UCSD um, in fine arts when I was 12. Um, my parents were involved with the university and um, I had private tutors for most of my growing up and we did lots of traveling. Um, and I ended up going to UC Berkeley and I left after my, in the middle of my third year because I gave birth to my first child and I was working full time and going to school and had a brand new baby and something had to give and you can't give babies back. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't not make money. So uh, school had to go. <laughs> Is it my turn now? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm much less interesting. Um, so growing up in Ann Arbor, um, I did my grade school and high school in Ann Arbor and I went to um, community high school, which is sort of the like artsy alternative high school um, over there where I also uh, took a lot of University of Michigan classes um, when I was a high school student and then moved to New York City and did my undergraduate at Barnard College um, in literature and creative writing with a concentration in poetry. So I always say that my first art, my first love of art is in, in words and literature. Um, and so that's where my background comes from. Um, I did one, I did my year abroad at Hartford College, which is part of Oxford University, because where do you go to study English literature? You go to England. <laughs> um, and then came back and finished up at Barnard College, which, side note, is the women's college at Columbia University. So some people don't know that. <laughs> female. Yeah, yeah, I use female, she and her as well. You do you want me to go first? <laughs> Um, so I usually um, would identify as queer, um, lesbian, or gay is the terms I usually use for myself. Yeah, I'm definitely lesbian, gay, queer, uh, dyke is fine, middle-aged, Jewish, dyke <laughs> is often how I would describe it. <laughs> <laughs> So when we were looking over these questions and when we were talking to each other, the first thing I said flat out was, well, we're a really small startup. And so you end up doing everything. If something needs to be done, you just do it. And you have to sort of like learn on the go and you just figure out how to get it done and you get it done. Um, but in terms of sort of like strength and weaknesses and division of, of labor between us, um, my my strengths and my background come more on the sort of back behind the scenes sourcing manufacturing um business to business 
end of things. Um, and then Liz's, Elizabeth's background comes more on the creative direction, um, marketing, production, and things like that. But you can expand a bit more on that. Yeah, I mean, we we do as much as we possibly can ourselves. Um, however, I, I'm i fortunate that I've been in this business for a long, long time. I have a lot of friends and connections. My daughter is doing illustrations and she's stuff for amazing. us. And yeah, she's, she's like helping us craft our like first eight emails for our relaunch. Um, so we, we definitely will enlist friends and uh, co-workers, people that we know. Um, there's a bunch of kids that are amazing that work on my team at work and uh, I've definitely, you know, brought them in to do work on the weekends and to do retouching and, um, you know, help us um, with photo editing and all these things. And um, I, I feel like it's been, everyone has been so positive and so receptive and eager to be involved. And That's I, the exciting thing. Yeah. Is that people come to us and want to work. Yeah, us. we're so tiny, but we we definitely are getting a very strong um, community built together around this brand uh, with a lot of excitement behind it and people just really wanting to be involved, which is very cool. It's a great feeling. Uh, I am definitely, I'm sort of dapper with an edge and I, I admittedly like a little bit of bling. <laughs> The secret is that me and all of all of Liz's little underlings that work for her want to steal her wardrobe when she retires pieces. So <laughs> we get to inherit nice things. Um, my style definitely leans, you know, in the middle, but a little bit more towards the femme side of the spectrum. Um, and I sort of would say the artist's black uniform for me, a little bit steampunk, um, a little bit weird. I like weird hats and like big things like that. Go, oh, come on, you're laughing at me. Um, you know I'm right. I'm but, just smiling because it's, <laughs> it's, it's very true. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wear black, steampunk, bondagey things, costumes, weird stuff, but black is basically the palette. <laughs> <laughs> with some metal thrown in there. <laughs> so I think that um, I can speak more to this a little bit more because I, I started the brand with my ex-wife and ex-business partner um, and then Liz joined recently. Um, but basically the whole brand and this sort of jumps to your question of like how the company was started as well, but it was basically going shopping and not being able to find anything. Um, and that being sort of my ex-wife was definitely a little bit more on the butch side of the spectrum than me. Um, and she was looking for sort of more masculine, masculine leaning underwear that would fit and flatter her body that was, that she felt comfortable wearing, that she felt sexy wearing, um, but that was also fun and cool and interesting as opposed to just being solid colors or being lacy or being pastel or having flowers on it. Um, and part of it was, you know, she would buy men's underwear that was really unflattering. And as her partner, I would be like, I know that's your style and that's what you want, but it's not sexy. It's not attractive just purely because it doesn't fit you. It doesn't fit your shape. Um, and then I decided, um, my ex-wife was, was French and there were at the time, and this was years ago, um, 2011 was when we sort of had the idea to start the brand. There were a couple European brands that were doing more masculine styles for women and they were very expensive. And I said, there has to be a way to buy this that I can purchase in America that's not so expensive, that is what, what she wants to wear and what would look good on her. And I spent hours and hours trying to, to search for this and shop for it and just didn't find it. Um, and so she came home from work and I said, I can't find it, we have to start making underwear. And she was like, I know, I've never been able to find it. And we were just crazy enough 
to do that. I actually launched with products for sale um, around Valentine's Day 2014. Yeah, so um, my ex-wife and I came, out, came up with the name um, and we did a lot of brainstorming, but what we really loved about Play Out was the, the definition and the idea behind play, behind having fun, being comfortable, enjoying what you're wearing, and also the brand having um, sort of an elevated, what I like to call urban athletics. So I think of like urban athletics as something like skateboarding, being, being very cool and having its own sense of fashion style, um, or like surfing, which I think of as sort of a little bit urban in a way, you know, like LA surfers or, you know, Sydney, Australia surfers, or that type of thing. Um, so that's where the play comes from. And then out having a double meaning, like out, play outside, go outside, or triple meaning even, or out being, um, obviously being gay, being out, and also out <laughs> in a really specific way. A lot of men you see with wide waistbands with the logo and the name of the brand peeking up above their pants because they're sagging. So their waistband is out. So play out being something that you show off that is sort of peeking out above your, uh, above your pants. So it, this company started with uh, briefs and from boxer boxer briefs and yeah trunks. like box, boxer briefs is more the 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 guys and the trunks is the technically female no you're reversing oh I'm it. reversing it sorry it's <laughs> I've been so focused on designing thongs for dudes. It's like <laughs> my brain is totally gone awry, um, <laughs> which I feel I am almost a master at. Um, the it started out basically having uh, anatomically male and female versions of a boy short. That both it just and it just depends on how you identify it. Really doesn't matter what. It, you know, it's what you assign yourself. So if it's a female who's packing, she can choose to wear the anatomically male one. If it's, you know, someone who isn't needing that, it's, it's you know, if there's junk to be placed, you have that option. And if you don't, there's one without it. People were wanting different types, which is why, like, we like to use the, the names of the style as opposed to saying these are men's and these are women's. Yeah. Just saying these are trunks, these are boxer briefs, these are thongs, these are bikinis. Choose whichever one you want. If you want space for whatever you want to put in it, <laughs> if you want to put a, flask. a banana in it or a flask, put a banana or a flask in it. Um, but like, you know, like we would have people that did have the equipment who really loved our stuff that were buying um, the, the flat fronted sort of traditional female cut, if you will, and then being like, these are uncomfortable, but we love them so much, but I need space for what I have. Um, so we, we decided to make two different styles. Um, and now we're expanding that, and I think this goes to your next question, um, into bikinis and thongs, but doing two versions, bikinis and thongs across the board, one with extra fabric and extra space, and one without. <laughs> yeah. Equal opportunity of each of those types of... And, and, you know, we don't care what your gender identity is or whatever, like whatever you are most comfortable in or whatever you want for your needs, or both, or none, go for it. Mm -hmm. well, do you want to speak? Yeah. To versus yeah. So I think that it with with fashion, or even outside of fashion, selling a product in general these days has become easier because of direct to consumer, because of online sales. Um, the old way of starting a fashion brand before the internet would be, you know, you have an idea, you create a sample, you shop it around to buyers, which would most likely be department stores. And that department store would place an order for whatever number, and then you would cut and sew that amount. Um, so, and, and the thing is, is that then you would sell that amount to the department store, which would then take on the risk so that if they didn't sell it, they would be marking down the price or whatever. Um, with, with the internet, with crowdfunding, that bar for entry has been lowered, um, which is 
really great at the same time, that means that the entrepreneur and the designer and creator takes on more of the risk. So you need to hold that inventory in multiple different sizes, in multiple different size styles yourself, um, instead of passing that along to the department store. Um, so for us, um, it's also about, in this day and age, in the internet, it's about brand recognition. So initially, um, we, and still are at the moment, um, directing our efforts towards direct-to-consumer through selling on our website, um, through selling online. But um, we have in the past, um, with a lot of the press that we had, um, we were approached by a few brick and mortar boutiques um, in different towns across the country. Um, and so they would stock it. Um, but we didn't, we didn't pursue wholesale directly. Um, whereas now, since we're looking to expand um, and we've changed um, our manufacturing and our back end a little bit, Wholesale is one of our newer um, avenues that we're working on. And it's good because we keep getting approached constantly. And when you have that need, what you want to say is yes. Like you always want your first response to be like, yes. And then, okay, wait, how are we going to do this? <laughs> and, and it, you know, but you want that instinctually. My, my, my go-to is to be like, absolutely. Okay, now let's figure out how we're going to make this happen. Um, and the need is there. The desire is there. So it's definitely something that we've had to take into consideration with this relaunch, um, making sure that when we are sourcing things and where we're having things made and how we're having them done, um, that it will facilitate that because it's going to be a very important part of our business going forward. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that um, just to clarify, something that we keep mentioning is we keep saying relaunch um, and whatever. And I think that to clarify that is just to say, um, I started the company with my ex-wife and ex-business partner um, and about, oh, a year and a half ago, um, she ended up exiting the business. Um, and so the business was put on pause for a little while, which is funny, I don't think many people were aware of because I mean, I was still running it, we were still active um, and still, the great thing is that clearly there's a need here because we still had a ton of interest. Um, and then Elizabeth and I have been friends for a number of years and I know that um, she's in fashion and we've worked together in a different capacity outside of play out. Um, and so when I was seeking a new business partner because I, I wanted to relaunch this and really take ownership of this brand with a new business partner um, as opposed to, you know, the, the original iteration of the company that I started with an X. Um, and so when we keep saying relaunch, that's, that's the future move that we're moving towards right now. Yeah, we're, we've basically, uh, in the summer is when we became uh, official partners in this. And uh, we have spent this time doing a complete overhaul. So different marketing structure, different goals, new mission statements. We've rebuilt our entire website, which hopefully goes live tonight. Tonight, according to, the, according to our according web to the developer. developers. Um, so hopefully that actually happens. And when I wake up in the morning, I'll be happy and not writing mean emails, but, um, definitely, uh, having a, a, a rejuvenation and, and starting, uh, with a different market structure. And for us, it's very important that it, it's, how do I say this? It's not about being in queer fashion. It's not about dominating queer fashion. We're looking to just create a space that is all inclusive in its marketing, in its messaging, in its ideations that is in mainstream fashion. It is just part of the larger fashion industry and not isolated in any format. It's just an accepted part of the norm. And to do that, you have to kind of take a very specific approach um, to how, who you're gonna speak to and how you're gonna speak to them. We want it to be broader than just speaking to a specific uh, niche marketplace. And though that's our foundation and that's you know who we, we, are, identify, yeah, yes. we identify with <laughs> and connect to, um, I want it to expand beyond that. And, and in saying that to Abby, when we were first talking about this partnership, because I was kind of doing some like brand consulting and some other things, we were like, 
should we just do this? Like, should we just stop having all these conversations and actually do this for real together? Um, it, it really just became at the forefront of our, our vision was to move it that direction and, and to just think in this much more uh, global headspace. And I think that um, with anything, whether it's a fashion brand or not, I mean, when you're choosing partners, you need to know who your partners are and make sure that you're on the same page. And I think that the beautiful thing um, is that we are sort of weirdly the same person. <laughs> and we didn't really know this before, but then as we've been working more closely together, it has become apparent. Um, all down to the same physical injuries. <laughs> But, um, you know, what I found very interesting, which I think whether it's in business or whether it's in your personal life, um, is that my ex and I started this business together. And I think that both of us compromised in certain ways on our vision. And it sort of gave it a little bit more of a muddled approach. Whereas once once we went our separate ways and really this was my baby and I was able to take control of it, finding someone who shared my vision and shared what I was trying to do made everything much more streamlined and ultimately more successful, I think. Yeah, so there were actually um, two, two boutiques in Virginia Beach um, that were selling, and if you want me to look up their exact names later, I have to go through my wholesale accounts, but, um, one in Wisconsin, I mean, they, they, one in Oakland, Oakland, the Bay Area, California, um, which, you know, we are, our, our price point, I actually realized we didn't say this when you asked this question, um, the boxer briefs of our, of our original styles, the boxer briefs retail for $24 and the trunks retail for $28. Um, and this is a price point that is very in line with the indie lingerie and underwear market. I mean, we're not trying to be Hanes. We're not trying to sell you a three pack for $15. That's we're also not trying to be agent provocateur and sell one pair of underwear for $180. Right. Um, but if you look at sort of other, because our inspiration, at least when I started this with my ex, came from men's brands, if you look at sort of more interesting, like, Andrew Christian or To Exist or things like that, those, a single pair of underwear for those brands is going to retail between $20 and $40. Um, and so that was the price point that we were, that we were looking at, um, that we really wanted to hit um, because it's sort of a, a reasonable price point, but in the better range for an indie label. Um, so that, that speaks to that. Um, and so, yeah, that being the case with the price point, you know, I, I do see the brand a, as a little bit more cosmopolitan. Um, you know, people that we're targeting are, are buying things online or are going to boutiques. They're not buying their underwear at Target. Um, or maybe they're buying their underwear at Target and they're buying their, un, their more expensive underwear online as well. Um, but that's also why it was surprising and also excellent um, that we were approached by these boutiques in Wisconsin, in Virginia Beach, um, that were interested in, in stocking our stuff. So well, now we get Texas involved. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we just met with a, a retailer that was in town uh, from, from Texas and- From Houston. Yeah, and they they really want to carry the stuff. So I'm, I can hardly wait till we have new stuff to show them. And I, I mean, it's, the excitement level and it's it's so funny because it's we're poised with all this other stuff we're about to bring forward too and we're just waiting on like final approval like samples that we can place other cut orders and, and have so much more stuff to offer and and it that you know we're in talks about doing collaborations with uh tattoo artists to do prints for us and for all these other people that we know that do these amazing things and and uh, to collaborate with them in all these different formats. And I feel like we're, the best is yet to come and we're still having all this energy and this immediate uh, desire for the product. So just knowing that that is waiting for us is an amazing feeling also. 
and especially because in all honesty, the brand has taken a little bit of a break as far as developing new stuff. Um, I think part of why I wanted to get involved with this company so much is because no matter what, it always gets this wonderful press and people show interest and there is a space for it in the marketplace and a space to develop and grow. And who wouldn't want to be a part of that? Yeah, I think um, for this round, uh, you know, the first thing is looking at um, demand. And there definitely is a demand for different shapes. And we realized um, too, just having a mind for inclusivity, there's a, you know, we, we weren't speaking as much to our femme audience and we weren't being as, uh, you know, we didn't have a strong offering for them. And it definitely was something that we wanted to add on immediately. And in looking at that, it really, you know, there's a lot of different brands out there. So comfort then becomes a huge part of it. Everybody wants to be comfortable. Um, and everybody wants to feel good, even if it's under what they're wearing. I truly believe as somebody who's been in fashion for a really long time, that people just feel better when they like what they have on. And that's just not the outer layers, that's all the layers. <laughs> you know, if you're going to work and you know you have a date tonight and you're like, I'm gonna look awesome Absolutely. in everything I'm wearing, because I am ready to have a great night. You want to have that sense of, of confidence and that sense of, of self and feeling sexy and just feeling good in your own skin. Um, and if we were really going to expand on that platform, it had to be more inclusive of people that like different styles other than just these two main core styles. Um, and definitely looking at the runway, um, which I'm always immersed in just because it's part of my job. Uh, looking at colorways, looking at, at, you know, what is trending and speaking to that, but then sort of taking it away and processing it and putting it through our own lens so that we are speaking to our brand, but taking nods from here and there. It's nice to have the influence and to see what is moving throughout the industry um, and let it inspire you, but not dictate what you're doing. And I think that, you know, speaking, well, speaking to shapes and sizes, um, one thing that even before Elizabeth came along with what I was working on for, for years, I mean, one of our original goals was an expanded size offering. Mm -hmm. um, but as a very small brand, I mean, you have to start somewhere to just get product out there. Um, and I think that I don't, I don't know if you ever follow or if people have have read the lingerie addict but it's an incredible lingerie blog um, and Cora Harrington has done an amazing job um, with her website and with her blog um, but she's tried to explain to people sort of why indie lingerie specifically is so expensive and I think that when you focus as we do mainly to start with on bottoms it makes it a little bit easier but she has spoken to to bra size offerings and how people are always like, you know, why can't I get this cup size with this band? Um, and she's like, look, when you go to a manufacturer, they have minimums that you need to meet. And so then, you know, it doesn't only become, I want to make 20 of cup A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. And then it becomes, well, when you put the band sizes with that, you know, well, we need 20 of each band size. So then you're going from, you know, whatever, 28 inches to 48 inches and it's very extremely hard to have the backing and the funding to actually do all of those different what would in the industry be called SKUs right um, and so when we started we needed to start small through Excel but one of the first things that we're working on right now as well is expanding our size size offerings mm -hmm. um, and to be able to just produce everything in larger sizes because absolutely inclusivity that needs to be a priority mm -hmm. um, in terms of I think you know color and design inspiration um, what Elizabeth was talking about is definitely at the forefront, um, but also bringing our own interests to that. So like, like she mentioned, 
um, working with tattoo artists, um, working with our friends who are artists who are doing really cool things, um, taking inspiration from, you know, museum exhibits or that type of thing. Um, because we want, you know, we want to elevate, just live in the world of elevated fashion in style. Um, not necessarily, you know, queer fashion doesn't have to mean your basic whatever, you know? Um, so, so we definitely take inspiration from, from art and from the world around us and from people doing cool shit. Yeah. A lot of the inspiration comes from people too, because I, I mean, obviously, and I think some of the questions on there about, you know, do we have, I have a list of muses as long as my arm and I am constantly in castings and constantly talking to people and, and, you know, being out in the world, meeting new people who are doing interesting things. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of what you could call fashion muses and models that I would love to work with and who are awesome or who I have worked with. And I think they're just really cool people. Um, but it's also, you know, it's painters, it's architects, it's, uh, you know, writers, it's pe filmmakers. We know exactly. all these interesting yeah. people. And, yeah. and, you know, sometimes you'll just be talking with them and something comes to your mind. It's like, I can totally picture you wearing this. <laughs> and I don't say that out loud, but in my head, I'm like, mm hmm, mm hmm. Yeah, I could see this. This could be the Lindsay color palette, you know, or whoever it is. And, and it really just strikes you and you get inspiration um, from the darkest places. <laughs> so, in terms of location, um, we definitely try to do what we can um, made in America. Um, and then at the moment, uh, we have a really, real, you know, want to make sure that people that we're working with are trustworthy and that they treat their workers fairly, um, and stuff like that. Um, working with, a, a cut and sew facility in Mexico. Abby was really lucky to, just before I came on board or in the, a month or two before that, um, had started working with this, um, this woman uh, doing sourcing and who has uh, an amazing facility in Mexico and and we met with her uh, a few times and she um, it's interesting because you need to have that connection there's a lot of things that I do in my job too where it's via email or I'm talking to people from a distance or you know there there'll almost be no human connection to it um, and in something like this, you're entrusting so much now with your brand and who your brand recognition is to the people who are helping you construct and make your garments and therefore your brand and your dream and, and your vision. Um, it was really nice meeting somebody who was so genuine and really enthusiastic, enthusiastic and on top of her game. Um, and it, you know, somebody that when we Skype with her and we're having meetings from a distance, you know, she, she will be holding her computer and like walking through her offices and walking through the manufacturing area Four, and yeah. yeah. And like talking to people or asking a question specifically about what we're working on, um, which is kind of amazing. And, and I, sometimes I'll just flash and think about a time when that wasn't even an option because technology didn't exist in that way and how much trust you were putting in someone from a distance. And it's kind of shocking to me because, you know, I, I yeah. feel like you have um, such a better gauge of what's going on with your product now because of all of the options you have with technology. And what I think is also really important um, is that, you know, when I first started this with my ex, one of our goals was to do as much as we could in the United States. Um, but even then, and this was six, five, six years ago, you run up against um, just so much of the industry has moved overseas and people do not even have the machinery yeah. anymore. Um, the machinery to stitch the flat stitch or to measure out the waistband the way that it needs to be done to make manufacturing possible. Um, and so it's really amazing being in New York City. I mean, that's something that, I, you know, a, a year, no, two or three years ago, I was walking home from a, a 
brand film shoot that we did. And, you know, I had had such success working with a director and an assistant director and the models that we used for that. And just being like, there's nowhere else that I could have accomplished this. Um, New York City, the garment district in New York City um, is really a special place that is that is dwindling. I mean, there's a movement called, there's a nonprofit called Save the Garment Center here in the city, just because so much of this industry has moved overseas. In terms of the original styles, um, we have the boxer brief. So here's one of those. Um, so you can see the stitching on the front and you can see the wide waistband. Back Here's the whole thing. Um, and then you have the seam in the back. And then on the trunks, which are the ones that do have the extra fabric. Um, it's hard to see, I think, with this. Do you want to hold one side of it? Like this, that has the <laughs> well, I can stick my hand it, in it. You gotta, you gotta give it a little profile. It's got, <laughs> it's got a little, uh, it's got a little, little extra pouch. <laughs> and then these also these also do not have a center seam in the back. Yeah, these are just a, a solid piece in the back. Yeah. Um a big thing about these two is is and I've been wearing every form of boxers, boxer briefs, uh <laughs> I for years and years um buying dudes underwear. Um a nice thing about these underwear too, and the first time I tried them on, I was like, get out, is where the waistband hits is a little bit lower than normal. They're low rise so, exclusively. Yeah, they're low rise and uh, as will be the bikinis and the thongs. And because they have that wide waistband, it's a very soft waistband. So it doesn't roll or fold over the way that you might imagine it would. And there's a lot of times when you wear stuff and, and everything feels great except for where the waistband is and then you have you know the dreaded not silhouette and very much this is as i yeah the <laughs> you always worry about the the dreaded muffin top or you know ha trying to have that uh you know as best a silhouette as you can have and just that sense of comfort as well um and because we're committed to having an extra soft waistband and having it sit a little bit lower on the hip, you avoid that folding over or that stiffness a lot of times that you experience with different underwear. Um, and so just a new shape that we're coming out with is the bikinis here. Um, and so full coverage in the back and then I can open it so you can see where the front is there. Um, and then also working on having a thong. This is a sample this that is a sample. they actually have modified. So, since so you're getting this sneak peek of some samples. Um, and then also using our like same super soft fabric, just basic tank tops. Oh, you didn't grab a beanie. I can grab a beanie. She's gonna grab a beanie, mm -hmm. but basic tank tops. Um, with accent stitching, I mean, something like adding like fun details like that. She's grabbing a beanie. Yes. The logo. So, yeah, basic, fun, comfortable. And we can send you like actual photos of everything as well. Yeah, we have a, we have a couple of, of uh, cool limited edition offerings too with our relaunch. Um, one of which we actually don't have the sample at this moment because we've sent it out to, there's a amazing seamstress in New York that's gonna be making a, a limited run of them for us. Um, but it's very cool. It's, it's almost like a necklace that's like a jacket lapel so that it does hang over, but you could put it on the outside of a t-shirt. If you wanna be very suggestive, you can wear it with nothing underneath <laughs> it. <laughs> um, or you can wear it over, you know, a button down. It has a lot of options, but um, but it's definitely something that I think is a cool and unique piece that we wanted to use in our lookbook for the relaunch. Um, so those will be available uh, on the site when everything goes back up. Um, I think that two really big successes for us, um, the first was in 2014, um, we participated in Lingerie Fashion Week. Um, and that was really amazing because it was 
really sort of a mainstream catapult for us. Um, so we, speaking to what we had talked about, about just like making queer fashion, it's just fashion, um, and got a huge response from that, um, international press and that type of thing. And as well as following that up in terms of speaking to friends and strangers that are interested and really you know, responding to our brand, um, a friend of mine that I had known for many years um, is a breast cancer survivor. And they had had a double mastectomy without reconstruction. And sort of we simultaneously approached each other and they were like, um, they use the pronouns they, um, they were like, I would love to model your underwear. And we were like, we would love to work with you. Um, let's do this. And so we did a editorial with, with um, them and two other breast cancer survivors in our underwear topless. Um, and it sort of was, you know, this was a photo shoot that we did in 2015. Um, and it was sort of the beginning of a lot of the visibility of breast cancer survivor scars without reconstruction. Um, because I do, I do think, and what, what my friend was responding to was that the dominant narrative was you go in for the surgery and you're pressured to have reconstruction. Um, and so they wanted to push forward the narrative, and it's not just narrative, the reality that 58% of people who undergo double mastectomies choose not to have reconstruction, um, which is, you know, over 50%, like, come on. Um, but it's I'm just really, <laughs> and, then, and then Liz joined the brand and she is one of them. And this was before, I mean, we were friends, but it was before she was part of the brand. And so um, we really felt like, you know, they wanted to tell their story and we really wanted to help that happen. Um, and so it was this magical intersection of fashion, sexuality, gender identity, healthcare, cancer, breasts, women, reconstruction, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, still, still having these conversations and they're very important. I feel like uh, just uh, having been in fashion as long as I have been and having been we're as long as I have been, which is even longer. <laughs> um, that I I feel like that platform and that mission statement, it will be interesting how it is received. I feel like we will definitely get a lot of flack for it from some people and from some uh, colleagues in the industry, etc. And I completely understand that. And I I. I feel like there's room for everyone and there's room for many different forms of success. Um, and I think it's just, you know, it, it's not about comparison or trying to be like someone else or not, or specifically not like someone else. It's that within our structure and our larger goals that they lie within just taking this section and moving it forward to just be part of a whole. I like to tell this little anecdote uh, because it was told to me when I was first stepping into figuring out how to actually get my vision created, um, which is, I don't know if you know the story of Joe Boxer, but that, that brand, the Joe Boxer brand, which is now sort of like the Walmart in-house men's underwear brand, was started by a gay man in the early 90s who wanted to make fun underwear. And I mean, it was so successful and it was so well received that clearly it was bought by Walmart. And so sort of, I think the origin story of that has been lost a little bit, but as an underwear brand, that was one of the first stories I heard about. Um, from actually one of the people that was very involved and started the Save the Garment District initiative here in, here in the city. Um, because like I said, when my ex and I first started out, our first stop was Save the Garment District was how can we get this made in the US? And obviously we were living in New York, so can we get it made in New York to begin with? Um, so. I also feel like it's interesting in having conversations about the topic of queer fashion. Um, 
because I've been in fashion for so long, I feel like I just want to go, I don't okay. want to say anything, but there's a lot of gay people in fashion. <laughs> like, so gay. I, I hate to break it to anybody who was thinking that that was just a super straight industry marketplace. <laughs> But, you know, yeah, it's definitely totally. one of those things where it's like, it forever, it's been gay men dressing straight women. Totally. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. it's such a thing and it's so understood. It's funny because the place in which there wasn't a lot of, of, um, of, you know, gayness inside of fashion is lesbians. Yes. I worked yeah. for a decade and I don't know if I met another lesbian in fashion. And it's so interesting because and I think that's the most interesting turn for me in the industry is that it there's a lot more gay women that are involved in it now and there's a lot more women that have come out mm -hmm. who maybe were in it before but would not reveal that part of themselves because as we all know, the business of fashion is extremely cutthroat and extremely competitive, and it was not a safe space to uh, talk about that. And it, it was safe long, you know, much earlier on to be a gay man in fashion and have that be accepted. It may not even have been that talked about, but it was just a known thing, and nobody made any bones about it, and it was fine. You could be the head of a brand. You could be uh, the, you know, the... Um, the front man for a brand and it, it was a non-issue but i think the the idea of a lesbian being doing fashionable that, being yeah. fashionable and you know being the masthead of a brand is still a new next level thing you know it's not all cargo shorts and cargo shorts and and tevas and, and you know patagonia and, and, you know <laughs> LL Bean. yeah you know all of that is amazing and there there that is you know, definitely part of the community. However, I think the idea of, of having a lesbian that is just, you know, balls out unapologetically gay and out and being a superstar in fashion has not happened yet. I can, uh, I look forward to the moment. But I also think that that, <laughs> Um, speaks to my excitement about this brand and about one of our strengths, which is that I have mentioned before, and I've mentioned in a lot of interviews before, I came from absolutely no background in fashion whatsoever. Um, and I think that people that do come into industries, like I was just reading a book recently that, you know, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, he wasn't a bookseller, but he created this website that became this mega giant started out selling books online. You know, so I take my sort of outsider approach um, as, as one type of strength. But I think that what makes it really exciting at this moment in time is joining together with Elizabeth and having her absolute, you know, um, professionalism and experience in the in the industry and marrying those two things and creating this really exciting forward momentum it's interesting it's it's definitely been um, for me I would say much more so in the last five years even Absolutely. and it's very recent still uh, it's it's one of those things where even in the last four years, I've worked at places where, uh, you know, I, I knew some, that somebody was a lesbian and we had maybe had like our own connection in that way in chatting. Um, but they, it, it was interesting because I was at a, a, like a senior management level at that job. And when I left this, this woman was a, a photographer and she, wrote me a card and and she said you know thank you for for always being an example of being true to yourself i really appreciate that and it really makes me feel like i can do what i need to do in this industry and be successful at it and it's funny because i just didn't really connect those two dots because it just hadn't really come up that much i've had more junior people um you know, and, and people that I've been a mentor to or that have worked on teams for me 
um, say amazing things like that, but not in not about just being out and being really present in who I am and staying true to that, no matter what's going on around me. And that's been more recent as well. It really struck me. And I've had it happen since then again. Um, but now it's, it's, I, it's much more prevalent and, uh, you know, it, how it's just, it sounds so silly, but to me, it's just, it's probably a bigger compliment than any other thing I've ever heard in my career. Um, because I just wasn't thinking about it in that way. I just like bulldoze through life and I'm just me and I'm just doing my thing. And, and to have someone take note of it in that way and then reflect it back to me, I was like, Oh crap. I got to take that more seriously. Like I need to, to, um, Purposefully. Yeah, very purposefully and, and be very mindful with people that work for me going forward and that work with me uh, and really work on making a space for them. Because it showed me two things. It showed me one, that she needed somebody who was giving her inspiration in that way. And, and two, that she currently was not in a space where she felt comfortable with that. And I don't want that to be the case. And I certainly, you know, feel like we can set a tone in everything that we are attached to um that creates a safe space but it was interesting it was a very it's a very large luxury uh brand that i worked for and i i it just didn't occur to me as much because of because i came into it at a management level and i already had done a lot you know i i, I had kind of already proven myself in the industry and so to me, I didn't feel like I had to do that. And it just really, really resonated strongly with me. And she was at the beginning of her career in, in the fashion industry. And now I'm like so hyper aware of everything all the time. And I'm just like, all right, <laughs> we can do this. We're going to make this happen. If there's ever a problem, whatever. It was interesting, the, the, the Women's March when that happened. Um, my daughter flew out from the West Coast, and my girlfriend and friends of ours, we all gathered and, and uh, In attended. In D.C. From yeah, New York. we went to D.C. We went to D.C. And, uh, and tons and tons of people that I knew, and tons of people from my office even, uh, went. And we're, it, it became so clear to me that there was room for all of this, that it no longer was the old set of rules that in general there was a tone of openness and though that was about women's rights and women's issues as a whole and being half of the freaking species that is not uh treated properly that within that it was breaking open a door for basically uh anyone who was not experiencing equality and that within that, I was going to figure out any way that I could every day that I was at work to make a better space for everyone. I spent so many years just kind of like in the grind and like putting my head down and just being like, I'm going to do the next thing. I'm going to put one foot in front of the other. I'm going to move and do this. You know, I'm going to, uh, and I'm a, I'm a risk taker by nature. It just is part of my makeup. And I, I really... I just, I don't know why, but there just was a disconnect for me prior to that. And it, like I said, that happened a few years ago. But be before that, there was a disconnect because I wasn't, I just wasn't thinking about the platform in that way and how I could inform it in, in that space. I had really just been so focused on breaking down, making sure that I could still move forward and be myself. And that, just doing it for yourself is hard as hell <laughs> like just that and like pushing through and being like no i need people to accept me as this and i i'm going to stay true to to myself and my own personal aesthetic um you know and i'm i'm going to show that the quality of my work is such that it cannot be denied in and of itself um it, it, but then to have that that moment um just really solidified and took it to the next level for me the conversation and the campaign that we did with the um, flat toppers with the breast cancer um, survivors. 
uh, I think for me, I'm really proud of the fact that you have made a product that keeps people coming back over and over again. And it has maintained a conversation in an industry that has sort of exploded around you. I, I must say this brand um, goes back far enough that it very much was in the seedlings of this type of movement. And as far as the underwear conversation goes, was at the beginning of that. Um, underwear is now a much larger conversation in the last few years in the fashion industry as a whole. Um, and I have said to Abby, because there's, there's kind of two ways to look at it. You could be frustrated that all these other people have sort of joined on this bandwagon and it's now become this big extension and it could seem like there's more competition. The way that I look at it is if you're just sitting there by yourself trying to swim, swim upstream and create this conversation on your own, that is a much harder position to be in as a little guy manufacturer than to have it be that there's a larger wave that you can ride, which there is now. Now there's a larger conversation about underwear. There's all these different brands um, that have really stepped out and made this more of a, a acceptable conversation. And it's not just about lingerie. It used to be that you talked about underwear and it was, it was either two things. It was utilitarian or it was, you know, sexual and very much about sexy, provocative lingerie. Now there's this great, huge middle ground where it's about self-expression, it's about comfort, but it's also about, you know, having a good time. And, you know, almost like you have this little secret and you're just like, well, I have these crazy underwear on today and they put me in a good mood. And before I even walk out the door, I just know that I'm going to have a good day. Like, I've got my crazy yellow underwear on and I love them. <laughs> the other thing that... Um I, I always find is more important to point out when I do interviews with straight or mainstream, if you will, brands. And a question that I get asked is, you know, is queer fashion, is androgynous fashion, is gender free, gender neutral, gender queer fashion a trend or a fad? Are you, you know, jumping on the bandwagon of this, of this moment that's happening? Um, and, and my answer to that is always, Absolutely not. I mean, we started thinking about this in 2011 before this was even really a conversation. And this is who we are. This isn't a fad that we're capitalizing on in any way. Um, we would be doing this regardless of whatever, you know, interest there is that's happening right now. We'd be wanting to do this for ourselves. And then people are clearly inspired and interested in it. And that inspires us more and lights a fire under our own butts to continue doing what we're doing. And I mean, now we're looking at, basically we're in the midst of a fashion revolution as far as gender fluidity. Um, Condé Nast has just launched the first uh, magazine, Them, um, and that is based on that platform of, of inclusivity and, and uh, gender fluidity in fashion and, and in self-expression. I mean, you could stick a pin in me because if you had asked me even 10 years ago if I thought that that was that close in time to being a, a reality, I probably would have shrugged it off and just been like, mm, I don't know about that. Um, I definitely think that the millennials are not having it. They are just, you know, they have a different mindset. They... Uh, it's their time to push boundaries. It's their time to find those things that are really important to them that they're actually going to really risk and push themselves forward with. And I think that that is one of those that is one of those clear topics that is not going to be denied. I, I feel like there's a lot of things trying to be squashed in the media. There's a lot of things trying to be squashed by the government. And the one thing about doing that is that every time Every time you push too hard, <laughs> there's going to be a nice big backlash against it. And I definitely, I, I know so many kids in their 20s, um, and I don't say kid to be condescending. I'm, I'm old as the hills, so I feel like everyone is against me. <laughs> um, Liz and Abby show. I told you this was happening. You know, my, my kids are 27 and 25. So anyone that's around their age or younger are kids to me. Um, they, 
they are moving in this direction of a larger conversation that will not be denied. Well, I mean, I think that just from a fashion standpoint, being able to create a product was, was really difficult. And there were um, a lot of surprises, like I was mentioning earlier in terms of like how many sizes you can offer or what goes into finding a factory to make it. Um, because from the beginning, um, you know, I didn't want to be sitting in my living room sewing single pairs of underwear. This was a larger and a more elevated and a more professional conversation I was trying to offer people and trying to have. Um, and so I think that just trying to be in fashion is very, very difficult. And, and there's a lot of surprises and unexpected obstacles that you have to get around. So, um, have not approached investors, um, started out not wanting to approach investors, wanting to have an established product with an established business model um, that had, you know, a proven sales and income record before, before doing that and before sort of forfeiting a percentage of the company um, without a proven product. Um, so that is down the line, was always down the line, um, but definitely not a starting place. Um, and something that I always like to point out to people is that there's, there's such a big conversation, I think, at the moment around investors, around startups in the tech sphere. Um, and I think that the big difference between tech and not just fashion, but between selling a product of any kind is that when you're in tech, you have a lot of very high startup costs. You create the app or you create the service or the website and you put a lot of money into that and then that's done. And then you have your product and the rest of your money is going towards marketing and sales. Whereas when you are selling an actual item, a lot of your investment money and a lot of your, um, even sales income has to go back into creating more physical products. Um, and so that is definitely a consideration and a challenge where some of your revenue stream is going into creating the product and then you're left with less revenue to put into marketing and to put into advertising and sales. Um, that being said, uh, we did, when we first launched, um, and first started thinking about this, it was definitely what I like to consider the bubble of crowdfunding. I do feel as if crowdfunding has moved on. Um, you know, I think that people were so inundated for a number of years with donate $5 to this thing that I'm creating um, that people stopped doing that. Absolutely. You know, I think that there is a small sphere of people that are very involved in that at this time, but I think the greater conversation has moved on. Um, however, when we first started looking at launching, it was at the beginning and in the midst of crowdfunding. Um, and so that definitely was, what was so good about that actually um, speaks to what I sort of started talking about at the beginning of this interview, which is when you went to a department store with your sample saying, I wanna make this product, it gave you a number, a quantity of how many you should make. And so when you do crowdfunding and you say, pre-purchase this item at a discounted rate, it gives you as the manufacturer, as the designer, an amount. And so you know that that amount is already sold. Um, whereas, like I said, there's a lot of risk in holding inventory and also multiple colors in multiple shapes. Um, and so crowdfunding is very appealing for that reason. Um, ultimately, it's also, it's also a marketing thing, absolutely. Um, and so we did, in the very, very early stages, it sort of also becomes um, a market test are people interested in this? Do they want this? Will they pay this price for it? Um, and so we did do, um, we did two crowdfunding campaigns actually. Um, and I'm not embarrassed in any way to talk about it because it was actually really, really good and really helpful for us. Our first one was unsuccessful because you do have to choose an amount. You have to choose a dollar amount that if you don't hit, you don't get anything from. Um, and so it actually, in being unsuccessful forced us to recalibrate what we were doing and actually when we had done the crowdfunding because with fashion 
um, it comes into a quantities issue. Um, and so you have to meet minimum amounts for the factory to create what you want. Um, when we first did the crowdfunding, we were only able to offer three different designs because of this minimums issue. And so when that was unsuccessful, we were like, that was never our goal. Our goal actually was to offer more limited editions of things in very interesting and exciting graphics and colors and different colorways and to constantly be refreshing that and offering new things for people that we weren't able to do in the original um, approach we had. So it forced us to reassess and then do things a better way. Um, so that was really good. And then the second Kickstarter that we did was explicitly for a goal, which was raising enough money to be able to show at Lingerie Fashion Week, because showing at any Fashion Week is extremely expensive. Um, and that was a much more modest goal, and it was also a much more directed crowdfunding campaign. Um, and so that was successful. Um, and it was helpful and very exciting for people. And ultimately, you know, Laundry Fashion Week was an amazing jumping off platform for us. Um, so, yeah. Um, so Laundry Fashion Week took place in October, 2014. Um, and the Laundry Fashion Week season was, it was spring, summer, 2015. Well, I think ideally it's everyone <laughs> because that's, that's my goal. Um, I think that basically, it, I think really it has been more in the past speaking to, um, you know, more of a tomboy element and it had been focused, it was really picked up by that um, vibe and the woman who's, who skews a bit more masculine on the normal scale and wouldn't necessarily want to wear thongs or bikinis. She's looking for something outside of that um, to wear and feel comfortable in. Um, but I think going forward, it, it's a much broader voice that we'll be using. Well, and it's interesting and very exciting for me because when my ex and I first started the company, I wanted to make, I mean, we originally started out with, with, three styles, the boxer brief, a bikini, and a thong, because I wanted to be inclusive in that way. Um, but actually, when we did that first Kickstarter, the overwhelming response was towards the boxer brief, was towards the more masculine. And so we saw it that- It was needed. It, it was that really needed, needed hole in the market, the exactly. Um, in terms of a greater sense, um, I always say that age range usually, usually falls sort of between 25 and 60. If we're talking, you know, when you're, what is fashion, who is buying this? Um, 25 and 60, because it needs to be someone with enough income to be spending over $20 on one pair of underwear. Um, whereas, you know, people in high school, I've actually, you know, it's what's really, one thing that's very exciting is that we um, have sold at Pride festivals and events, for example, and have had people come up the next year, maybe a young kid, maybe an 18 year old in high school or a 20 year old being like, I couldn't afford this last year, but I saved up because I knew you were gonna be here again at Pride and I wanted to buy one. Because they are a little oh, bit just pricier um, for people that are um, either don't have their own income or haven't started working yet. Um, so it tends to be someone who has graduated from college who you know wants to buy something a little bit nicer for themselves has moved on from buying a three pack of, of Hanes or whatever um, in terms of price point that's sort of what I was getting at an age range um, definitely in the past um, social media which Elizabeth will speak more to in two seconds um, and also from editorial campaigns that we've done um, all of the articles international, national, I mean, Huffington Post, Huffington Post UK, the Daily Mail, which is UK, people.com, um, press that has come out of um, lingerie fashion week, press that has come out of our campaign with the breast cancer work, uh, press that came out of um, rainbow fashion week, which we did in 2015, um, because we had uh, breast cancer, double mastectomy models walking the runway, um, has all been, editorial um, interest pieces. We haven't paid for any of that. Um, and so people have definitely found us through, through that exposure and through those articles, um, which directs them 
to our website for direct to consumer e-commerce sales. But Elizabeth is gonna talk more about social media. Um, well, I, I definitely, obviously, Instagram has caused a full-blown revolution, both in people's attention spans, as well as how you market <laughs> to the general population. Um, I, I mean, I, I come from, you know, marketing and, and have been on that side of things for so long and, and thinking about how you uh, perform in every facet of customer facing marketing. And for me, I, I feel like we kind of get to have, we have a great momentum already and now it's time to sort of take it to the next level. It's, we, we want to sort of graduate to that next spot where um, we are able to do very specific uh, online paid ads and to actually do pop-ups and be able to um, utilize the technology that's available. Uh, it's not inexpensive and you know I, I work for a company that does all kinds of um, all kinds of online marketing, everything from, you know, Ebates to, you know, these partnerships with all of these different uh, companies that generate traffic, that generate, um, you know, your click to open, that, that we analyze every piece of data that we get. And I think that, you know, we're, we're in a space where we can definitely do, you know, email, we can do social media, we can do uh, word of mouth, definitely events that are, that are in our community and, um, you know, we're lucky that we're in New York because there is always something cooking as far as fashion and there's always some kind of, um, you know, there's lots of group shows and group activities and thing, different communities within the arts that come together and that there's space to promote things like this in. Um, but definitely the, the, the goal is to start really being able to go after that online marketplace of paid advertisement. Um, so there's a lot of like avenues of contacting us. I mean, you can message us on social media, um, direct message on Instagram or on Facebook and whatever, um, or, you know, contact us forms on our, on our website. And so, I mean, I'm responding to the contact us forms on our website. <laughs> um, and both of us are responding to social media outreach, people that contact us directly. I think one thing about the aesthetics that uh, I would speak to is, um, you know, previously it, they, we'd always done, uh, you know, bold prints and, um, a lot of different color and we're moving into a phase of, of kind of, um, going back to basics because we had a lot of requests for, um, you know, solids or to do, we're doing color blocking and all these cool things with contrasting stitching and getting a little more into the details of each piece and really trying to bring those out and make them more, a, a stronger part of the overall design. Um, and then we are gonna move into doing a whole other set of prints, which we're gonna add to this. Um, we definitely are gonna do basic black for the first time because with everything and, and, you know, sometimes you just need, you need black underwear or white underwear because whatever you're wearing is going to be black or it might be a little bit see-through. You want to make sure that everything works and coordinates as a foundation garment because as cool as they are, they still are a foundation garment at the end of the day. Um, and so we definitely are, are, with this relaunch going to start with a really strong offering of really fun colors and fun color combinations but also having like a true just black version of each thing and a white version of each thing um for people who really want that because there was a lot of of um requests for that in the in the last little while um but definitely to start getting more um I think deeper collaborations with individual people and artists who would be creating those prints for us is the next wave. Less about just being like, oh, we're gonna make a bunch of prints that we are gonna you know, yeah, create. Yeah. And, it, and it's about having collaborations and bringing other talent in on, on each of those. Yeah, so 
I mean, in the should I talk about? Yeah, you past? can talk about what's up there currently, and I can. Yeah, talk I mean, about what's about to be up there. What we, I think that it really speaks to the um, community nature of of what we're doing. Everything that everyone we work with, um, we really have a strong um, connection with, or they've expressed interest and approached us. But in the very beginning, um, it was it was my exes and my friends. I mean, you know, we're talking not having investor backing, not having a lot of money, having friends of ours who are extremely excited, um, enthusiastic about what we were doing. Um, and so our, you know, originally, original three models that we worked with were friends of ours, which also, you know, um, spoke to our approach, my ex and I, from being outside the fashion industry, um, but also spoke to wanting to offer, absolutely offer diversity um, in our models, in terms of size, in terms of ethnicity, um, and that type of thing. You know, we had a couple of years ago an intern approach us who who was um, Chinese American. Her parents were um, immigrants from China, and she specifically contacted us and was like, "I saw your models, and you had diversity in." in your models, you know, a black woman, a Chinese American model, friend of mine, um, white models, and I want to work with you. I want to work for you because I, you don't necessarily, at the time, I mean, maybe it has changed. I think I'm positive that it has changed even just in the past six years, right? But at the time, you didn't necessarily see that as much. Um, and so that is definitely still something that, that we are committed to doing um, in terms of models that we're working with moving forward. Elizabeth can speak to that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, um, I love all different types of, um, of bodies and shapes. And to me, it's very much, um, it's a tool of the trade. It's not, it, you know, for me with my background, it's very much a, about the concept and it's all of these pieces coming together to make a marketing concept that I feel strongly about and to tell a story. And each one of those stories is, 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 you know, spoken in the same voice, but is telling something a little bit different because it's speaking to a different product or it's speaking to, you know, a different season or, you know, something that we are a collaboration that we're doing. Um, so for me, it's very much about um, putting the right constellation of talent together when I do photo shoots, um, from photographer to hair and makeup to model. And, um, you know, we have people that are coming up on our site. Um, one of the gals who's going to be on our homepage is, she's so awesome. And her name is Elle Dawson. And she's uh, a model in the industry and, and was so eager and cool about doing this and really wanted to be involved. Um, we have uh, uh, Nate, who's a dancer that I actually know through my girlfriend and he is just adorable. Adorable. He's, adorable. <laughs> He's the cutest thing ever. Um, and he was super excited to model for us also. And, um, you know, I definitely, I like having personal connections with people and there's a lot of people in the industry that I know that have expressed interest in working with us, um, as models. Uh, and then we have people that we, that are amazing well, people in the industry that are friends of ours. Our friend Mac is actually, um, going to be on our homepage. Well, we so that's, as well. that's, what's really interesting is that, you know, Liz, Elizabeth being in the fashion industry knows a lot of, you know, connections and friends is friends with a lot of um, those people and being on that, I don't want to say on that side, but being in that industry for so long, you know, my focus when I first started the brand was very much in the niche queer market of that. So, you know, I brought a lot of friends and a lot of connections in terms of like queer models and gender fluid models um, and, and adding that bringing that together with, with us joining forces. Um, and so, um, Mac Dial, who has walked in, um, you know, the Dapper Q fashion show, um, at the Brooklyn Museum, you know, she and I met, um, 
in California at Queer Fashion Week in 2015. And so um, she's modeling for us now um, and working with people like that um, as well. So yeah. she's a total badass. Badass. Basically, you just need to be a badass. A badass. <laughs> Exactly. Yes. <laughs> At whatever it is that you're doing and what your jam is, like, be a badass. Yeah. If you, uh, you know, serious confidence, total badass. Uh, yeah, we're definitely yeah. gonna want to put you in some underwear. Yeah. That's one of my favorite lines um, when I'm like selling at prides, and you know, people are just walking past and they're ignoring you. Um, I like to ask people if they want to feel my underwear because they're very soft <laughs> and it obviously immediately gets their attention. So <laughs> feel my underwear, please. I want you in my underwear. <laughs> and then I have to follow that up with saying, no, 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 I make underwear. <laughs> I don't think so. I'm, I'm trying, I'm going over it in my head now, just trying to think if there's any gaps or anything um, that we didn't, any connected tissue that we didn't cover. Um, no, I think, I, I feel like we covered pretty much everything. I think, yeah, I, it, I mean, it's interesting because we're in this weird space because we're about to, you know, do this relaunch and sort of just have this renewal of um, presence, injection. hopefully. Yeah, just in a new injection of, of styles and colors and um, and just put a new spin on it. And I think, you know, speaking with, uh, a broader voice but very um very much staying in the realm of inclusion it's all about adding there's no taking away it's it's not about exiting something it's definitely about just making our arms wider and bringing more more into this space with us uh, i will say it's for clarity I have had a double mastectomy, but it was uh, preventative because I had a couple of close calls and I'd had recurring issues for many, many years. So I did, I have not had breast cancer, um, but mm -hmm. I, I did choose to have the double mastectomy and not do reconstruction um, after having uh, a couple of uh, incidences where I was like, I can't live in a state of stress like this constantly. And that was all, that was before, um, yeah, that was, we became that was a few we years became business that was partners. Years so. We knew each other, but we're not business yeah. partners. But just time. to be clear, like because that came up in the same breath as that, and it, <laughs> and, and so I know what it is to to have flat top of pride. Uh, I I did not have breast cancer. It was just that it, it's kind of evident, and I had the I was positive for the BRCA gene and all that. And I was like, no, we're not gonna I'm not messing around. Maybe more clarity in that. So you did two crown. You did two crowdfunding uh, attempts, one successful, one unsuccessful, and but then other than that, it's self-funded. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To yeah. be clear, it's that we don't have any outside yeah. investors yeah. at the moment.